Welcome to the City Impact Church podcast. Join us weekly to listen to sermons from our Sunday services or our special events. For more information, visit cityimpactchurch.com or find us on our Facebook page. We pray you'll be inspired and challenged by this week's message. Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 2. Let's have a read of some scriptures. I was in the book of Nehemiah before I went away, and I just want to continue in it if I can. Uh, Chapter 1, verse 2. One of my brothers and some men from Judah came, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped and survived the captivity about Jerusalem. Uh, You've got to remember, of course, Jerusalem. It's like the church of the day today, and, uh, but back then it was the city of Jerusalem. They said to me, the remnant there in the province who survived the captivity are in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and the gates are burned with fire. When I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. I was fasting and praying. Everybody say fasting and praying. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven, and I said, Beseech you, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who preserves the covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear now be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant, which I am praying before you now day and night on behalf of the sons of Israel, your servants. Now, can I just please reiterate that this Friday night, this Friday night from 8 till 10, we're having the first of our four Friday night prayer meetings throughout the year. Uh, Prayer is such an important thing, is such an important part of City Impact Church, part obviously a very important part of the church worldwide. And so the first of four uh, this, this Friday night. I hope and pray, just like Nehemiah, that by the end of this message, you will be concerned enough I'm sure you are. I'm talking to good people today. You'll be concerned enough to come out and pray. Can I hear an amen to that? Verse 15. So I went up by night, Nehemiah says, after he traveled to Jerusalem, which was a long way to go. There were no airplanes and no cars. Uh, But I went up by night by the ravine and inspected the wall. Then I entered the valley gate again and returned. The officials did not know that I'd gone or what I'd done, nor had I yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials of the West who did the work. Then I said to them, you see the bad situation we're in, that Jerusalem is desolate, its gates burn with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem so that, that we will no longer be a reproach. I told them how the hand of my God had been favorable. I love that. Everybody say favorable. favorable. Mount Wellington, favorable. To me, and also about King's words, which he had spoken to me. Then they said, and I love this verse, let us arise and build. So they put their hands to the good work. Of course, we've been talking about believing, belonging, becoming, and building. Amen? And here they were. This is what they were doing. But look at in verse 19. Then Sanballat the hornet, how do you like that handle? Sanballat the hornet, Tobiah the Amorite official, Gisham the Arab heard about it. They mocked us and despised us and said, what is this thing you're doing? Now you might think, well, that's the Bible. That's a long time ago. Uh, But I'm here to tell you there are some ballots around today. I'm going to prove it to you in a moment, so stay with me. We need to understand that as a people of God, we are called to pray because not everybody understands what we're doing. And people will misunderstand us. People will uh, judge us. People will look at us like, uh, you know, some strange people, just like they did back in this day. Let me prove it to you in a moment. What is this thing you're doing? Are you rebelling against the king? So I answered them and said to them, the God of heaven will give us success. Therefore, we as servants will arise and build, but you will have no portion, right, or memorial in Jerusalem. There's some wonderful verses there. Let us arise and and build so they put their hand to the good work, just like you did at Community Day last Saturday. I heard over at Mount Wellington on Sunday night, at least 15 people came from the Community Day, gave their lives to Christ last Sunday night at Mount Wellington. That's a good work right there. It says that God of heaven will give us success. Therefore, his servants, you and I, hallelujah, will arise and build. Now, I noticed and I, and I, and I did highlight the Samballat, the enemy, uh, and Tobiah and Gisham in verse 18 and verse 20. 
But uh, in chapter 3, you'll notice that the people of God were working together, but so was the enemy. And sometimes the enemy is more together than the people of God. In chapter 4, let's have a look at it. Verse 1, it came about when Sambalat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became furious. You know, sometimes the enemy is happy if the church keeps quiet, keeps silent, just sits behind their wall, don't go outside the wall, stick to yourself. Enemy's quite happy. But when you want to stand up, speak up, <laughs> the enemy gets a little furious. He became furious and very angry and mocked the Jews. I don't know whether you know there's mockers out there. I'm going to prove it to you in a minute, so stay with me. He spoke in the presence of his brothers and the wealthy men of Samaria. What are these feeble Jews doing? What are these Christians doing? Are they going to restore it for themselves? Can they offer sacrifices? Can they finish in a day? Can they, can they, can they? Sounds a little bit like the devil in, <laughs> in Genesis chapter, chapter 3. Can they revive the stones? Can the dusty rubble, even the burned ones? Now, Tobah the Amorite was near him, and he said, even what they are building, if a fox should jump on it, he would break their stone wall down. Verse 6, so we built the wall and the whole wall and, and was joined together to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. I love that. Just by way of introduction this morning, you know, I believe as people at City Impact Church, we've got a mind to work in the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. But Sambalas, Tobias, Gishams are just as alive today as they were back here over 2,000, nearly 3,000 years ago. Their methods, their plans are the same, and that is to stop the advancement of the church, to stop building God's kingdom. You know, when Ezra and Nehemiah were rebuilding Jerusalem, it is recorded what the enemy wrote. Let's have a look at it in Ezra chapter 4. To the king, uh, Artaxerxes, Artaxerxes. It's a little bit like writing to our prime minister, Jacinda Ardern. Your servants, the men in the region beyond the river, and now let it be known to the king that City Impact Church, no, the Jews who came up from you have come to us at Jerusalem. They're rebuilding the rebellious and evil city and are finishing the walls and repairing the foundation. Now let it be known to the king that if the city is rebuilt and the walls are finished, they will not pay tribute, custom, or toll, and it will damage the revenue of the kings. Now, I want you to notice that it's about money. It's always about the money. It's about the tax. And uh, while I was away, I received this text, and I put it up on the screen. Some of you may have seen I don't know, but uh, it's from this person. They cut out the head of it. They cut out the, the person's name. I don't know why it's at the top. They may be able to slide it down a little bit more. I'm not trying to hide it, so don't think I'm trying to hide it in, in chapel it came up. But in any case, uh, this person writes, hey, people, just wanting to give you a heads up that I'm trying out the government's new petition system. I've started one to apply uh, taxes to religious institutions, specifically to remove the advancement of religion from the Charities Acts. Why? This is more target, targeted at scummy churches like Destiny, Arise, City Impact, and their leaders who use devious tactics like posting rank titles publicly to target their community's most vulnerable. Goes on to talk about other things, but enough to say that it's exactly the same as what Sam Ballot did many years ago. Can I just tell you now that you're not a scummy person? Can I just tell you that you are a child of God? Yes. Can I just tell you now that you're a royal priest of a holy nation, a people belonging to God? But people who have not had their eyes open, people who don't know, see you as, and me as a scummy person, and they're not for what we do. They don't understand what we do. Just like over in Turkey, they did not understand who Jesus was. Their eyes had not been opened. So our battle is not against flesh and blood. But our battle is against powers and principalities. That is why we must pray. I said, that is why we must pray. Come on. And so let's not be naive. The enemy, the devil, has been around for a long time. His tactics haven't changed. It's still the same today. 
And while we in our lovely church become complacent and apathetic, the enemy comes in and tries to attack. Well, it's time to wake up. Yeah. It's time to stand up and it's time to speak up because I want to tell you, God's kingdom will be built. Right. Amen? Right. But it's very easy for us to go to sleep and, and uh, have this enemy come and attack. And so here this Sam Ballot, and uh, just like they did then, wrote writing to the government to uh, endeavor to stop our work in over whole, whole tax. Amazing. So I just visited Asia Minor, which is known in the Bible as Asia Minor. Today it's known as Turkey. Now, Turkey seems a pretty strange sort of a name for a country to me uh, growing up in the 1950s, but I did learn something, that Turkey means the land of the Turks. Like Germany means the land of the Germans. Italy means the land of the Italians. And of course, it's got huge biblical significance. And also, I did learn, by the way, this might, 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 might tickle your fancy, but, um, you know, because I was talking to our guide, who was Turkish, and I said, you know, Turkey is such a, a, a strange name because, you know, we have this bird, Turkey, and, you know, and, and uh, he was saying that it's only the Western world that call that bird Turkey. English language. English language. He said they call that bird India. So the world's a bit of a strange place. That's what I'm saying. So sometimes we have these mindsets, don't we? And uh, I found it quite interesting. But of course, Turkey, Asia Minor, has got huge biblical significance, not only Cappadocia, where uh, the pilgrims were. And as you, some of you would have seen my photos of the underground city uh, where it was built by the Hittites in the 1500s, but Christians hid there from the Romans. There are crosses down there. I mean, these cities go down 45 feet, uh, dug out by hand. There's just room after room, numerous rooms and tunnels and incredible. I mean, you wouldn't get young people to dig those houses out today by hand. I mean, unbelievable work, of course. And, and it was so interesting going to this, uh, five of the seven churches, to Ephesus and, and so forth. But Colossians, we went to Colossae. Uh, we didn't get to go to Antioch. Antioch was a huge church in its day. There's a map of Asia Minor that comes up, and, and uh, it was a huge part of the early Christian church. But today it's 99% Muslim. I want to play you a clip uh, that I just took at the airport uh, coming out uh, with our guide. If we could play that clip, thank you. Well, hi, church. We're just about to play out of Istanbul back to New Zealand, but I just want to introduce you to our wonderful tour guide, Tomlin. He's been fantastic with us, and I just wanted to say hello to you. Hello. It has been a great pleasure to meet all of you, and it was a wonderful trip for myself as well. Have a safe trip. And he did say to me that we are the first born-again believers that he's met. Exactly. And so we had a great time yeah. talking about the faith and talking about things. So thank you so it much. It was Tom. wonderful meeting you. Yeah, Peter. great. Thank Appreciate you. it. So first born again believers, ha hello. What a responsibility to be nice. I mean, I don't know. We grew up in New Zealand and, uh, you know, we have uh, an understanding of some terms, whether it be, you know, evangelical or Pentecostal and so forth. He had not ever met he didn't even know what the term born again was to be honest when i endeavored to explain to him what born again was he thought that every born again person was in my church that was his understanding as i started to talk with him he thought it was our doctrine something that i'd come up with so I was talking to him about the worldwide body of Christ and how there's a b over a billion people, uh, charismatic people in the world today. He was blown away. He'd never heard of it. He's an educated man. Now, you and I have grown up in a wonderful country where we've had the opportunity to hear about Jesus. He had known about Jesus. He knows who Jesus was. He's been to Israel many times. He believes in Jesus, but not in Jesus. You know what I'm talking about? And so he didn't have an understanding of this term born again and evangelical. When I prayed for him at the airport, and Tim and Janine were there, when I prayed for him at the airport, tears started to come into his eyes. Prayer changes things. Prayer changes things. You might say, well, Turkey's not our problem. We're living in New Zealand. We're a long way away, just like Nehemiah was a long way away from Jerusalem. You might say, well, it's not our problem. Can I just say it wasn't the Apostles Paul problem either? Ephesus, 
Philippi, all these other places, and these other places, Thyatira and Sardis, the churches in the book of Revelation, the apostle Paul, he was a Roman Jew from Tarsus. He was living quite a comfortable life. Pharisees had it pretty good back in those days. Yet he made it his problem. He made it his problem because of the compelling force of the gospel. Once the apostle Paul on the road to Damascus, as I talked with Tomlin and explained the born again experience from the apostle Paul's account on the road to Damascus, then he understood. And the apostle Paul, his life was changed and he was compelled to get out of his comfort zone and get into the battle zone, as it were, and go to these places. And, you know, you may be sitting here with us on the North Shore at Mount Wellington and say, well, the West is not our problem. All those Westies out there, not our problem. We're on the North Shore. We're at Mount Wellington. We are quite comfortable, thank you. What, 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 why should we invest in Mexico, Tonga? We've got two teams, over 40 people, going to Mexico and Tonga in a couple of weeks' time. It's not our problem, China. Keith and Jan are up there now. It's not our problem in the Philippines. Not our problem. We could say that. Yet because of the compelling force of the gospel, because Jesus has changed our lives, because something happened to me, something happened to you, it causes us to get out from beyond our walls, from our comfortability. You know, when I think about problems, problems can be good, by the way. Because a problem really is an opportunity in disguise. We can learn that God wants us to see our problems as potential, our adversity as opportunities. That text and that person who's endeavoring to raise a petition against us and against this uh, tax and whatever, so maybe your tithes gets taxed, I don't know. But the thing is, is that we need to see as an opportunity to pray. It should cause us to press into God more. Right? Uh, either that or we're going to be swept away. You know, as Christians, as a people of God, you don't want to see difficulty in every opportunity, but you want to be a people who see an opportunity in every difficulty. God has a wonderful plan. That's why Nehemiah says, God will give us success. You've got to know Whose side you're on? You're not on the scummy side. It is true that those who are not born again will have no part in this inheritance. Nehemiah got a burden because he heard a report. He heard a report on how things are. I know the teams that are going to Mexico and Tonga, they will bring back a report, just like I brought back a little report about Turkey. I've been out to the West, and we'll talk next week about the West, and we'll show you the venue we're going to and so forth, so forth. But, you know, it doesn't take too much to understand what's happening in our city today. And so it says here, the remnant that are left in the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Now, I know a lot of people have given up reading the news and I understand why. First of all, there is a lot of fake news out there. There is. But there's a lot of sick news out there as well. I mean, uh, the Herald, to be honest, has become such a gossip machine, particularly, particularly over sexual issues. A lot of it's just trash, but you've got to pick through it and understand what is happening in our nation, what is happening in our city. Now, growing up in the 1950s, I have to confess that I thought the world revolved around New Zealand. But you know and I know, and for those who travel, I was just talking with Johnny, just got back from Germany, and, and uh, I was in the airport in Singapore, and uh, um, uh, Darlene, uh, husband, I'm sorry, Simon Fletcher happened to be there. He was on his way to Germany. And so people travel a, a, a lot today, and so we get an understanding. But, you know, here we are. I was watching our news last night because I thought I'd better just catch up. And, uh, you know, we're, the news was talking about how New Zealand's going to put pressure on Russia. <laughs> really? Because <laughs> uh, some people, you know, in New Zealand, we kind of believe that the world revolves around us. Most of the world wouldn't even know we exist. And they don't care. 
We are like a drop in the bucket. Let's be honest. But we think, you know, we're the big players in the world because the media portrays it that way. But what's happening in our city, and as Nehemiah, he was living in Persia at the time. He was in the king's palace. But he had listened to certain brethren who had visited Jerusalem. And just like the apostle Paul, they had no television to watch the news on. They had no radio, no internet, no newspaper. They didn't even have a telephone, let alone a party line, for those who remember. I mean, they had no way of communication except traveling by foot and by ship. And as I said, today, here I am in Singapore, and there's Simon Fletcher traveling through the same airport, passing through like ships in the night. I'll tell you a funny story, though, because I was in the airport, Tim and Janine were there, and Bev was there, and, and I was looking for an orange juice, and I, I, and I, and I couldn't find the orange juice. And I opened up this, this, the fridge uh, door, and they were like bare handles, you know, bare handles, because uh, I was looking for a glass for my orange juice. So I grabbed one of those, like a bear mug, and then the, the bear lever was right beside me. And um, I wasn't going for that. I was going for the glass. And that's just when Simon came up to me. <laughs> said, hi, Pastor Peter. <laughs> and I thought, you got to, I said to Tim, because uh, I told Simon to go over and say hi to Tim. And I walked over and I said, Tim, that's why I've always told you, you got to behave yourself wherever you go. <laughs> but it was too early in the morning for me to have a drink. <laughs> so in any case, I digress. Um, so there's no internet, no television, no nothing, no airports, as it were. But Nehemiah, he wanted some news, and, the, and he wanted some news. What is the city of God like? Are you concerned, my friend, for the body of Christ throughout the earth? Next week, because as you know, I was in Dubai. That was the whole reason for going. I was with churches from all over the world from nations. I'm going to show you a clip of a church in Bella Cruz. You know, I don't know whether you realize what's going on around the world in the body of Christ. Some churches, you think you've got problems with that guy with that text there? You know, I'm going to show you a clip. Armed guards coming in and closing down the service. I mean, just in Dubai right now, uh, the government is outlawing churches and hotels, and the host church that held it has to move out of their hotel and got nowhere to go. I mean, you know, churches are suffering around the world today. I was with churches from all over the world, significant churches, hearing the reports of what's happening. Amazing. I don't have time to go into it all. Next week, I'll talk about a couple, but I don't know about you whether you're concerned about the church worldwide or are you just comfortable in your little palace? And here was Nehemiah. He wanted to know. He said, let me know so I can see it, so I can visualize it, so I can get a burden, so I can do something about it. And they brought this report. And when he heard the report, Nehemiah wept, Nehemiah prayed, and Nehemiah fasted. You know, this week, I mentioned that we're going to have four prayer meetings on Friday night preceded by three-day fast. Now, I don't like fasting any more than you, and I know you think I'm a spiritual giant that loves to fast. And so this week, I'm calling City Impact Church to a three-day fast, to fast so we can come together to pray for miracles, to believe for your life and the life of the church, amen? But the report that they brought Nehemiah is he is living in a palace a long way away, uh, you know, they would have said, Nehemiah, you can't believe the degradation or degrade, what is the word? Degradation. Degradation. Something like that. I was in a hotel and Bev wanted to shine, and I rang up and I said, do you shoe shines? And I couldn't get, the, couldn't get it out. The poor guy on the other end of the line, I mean, he had enough trouble with English, but I think he thought I was from a foreign country. <laughs> so in any case, you can't believe the, the poverty you can't believe the, 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 the gates are burned, the walls are broken down, the city's filled with weeds, it's, it's overgrown, there's, there's, there's people living in the streets. Uh, uh, you know, we could say it in a modern day setting, it's like dairies are being robbed at knife point. You know, there's drug addicts, there's, there's teenagers getting pregnant, there's abortion in our schools. That's, that's what we're talking, my friend. 
This was a report that they brought back, and uh, people's lives were in a mess, and society was breaking down. And just like the Sanballats were around then, can I just tell you right now that society is in the same state? It's a huge problem, and it's a huge problem that could have overwhelmed Nehemiah. I don't know about you, but sometimes I get a bit overwhelmed by it all. I get a bit overwhelmed. I think, you know, what can we do? What could Nehemiah do? He was miles away. He didn't even have an airplane to fly to Jerusalem to check it out himself. He had to walk and go by boat. And as I said, he was living in a king's palace, so he was okay. And I know all of us are okay. We live in nice houses. We drive nice cars. We live in a wonderful country. And I thank God for our country. I mean, you go to Turkey, and I didn't have time to go to Gallipoli. We had a very short trip, but some of you may have been there. What a moving experience. I hear it is. And the Turkish people, are well, they know a lot about Anzac. And, you know, I thank God for people who gave their lives for our freedom and the natural. But I also thank God for people like the Apostle Paul and others who gave their lives so we can have freedom in the Spirit. And so Nehemiah was fine, and why make this problem his problem? Why make the city's problem our problem? Why make Tonga's problem or Mexico's problem or the Philippines' problem or India's problem? Why make it our problem? We're okay. We're comfortable. But he knew that... (laughs) That the city of God, and we could talk about the church, broken down. And what do the walls mean when it's broken down? Well, we were in Istanbul and Istanbul. And I learned something too, by the way. Because Istanbul used to be called Constantinople. Uh, Constantine moved Rome to Istanbul. Moved the capital of Christianity. He established it. And so when the Turks came in and in the 1950s, they wanted to change the name to Istanbul. And so they put out this whole propaganda machine. And a song came out. Istanbul, not Constantinople, Istanbul. Anybody remember that song? My mother used to sing it to me. And you listen to that song, and they talked about, on that song, it talked about changing the name in New York, and it's nobody's business but ours. I mean, it's quite an interesting song, actually. But it's like a propaganda machine to change the name from Constantinople to Istanbul. And so Istanbul, a city, like every city back in those days, has got walls around it. Walls around it. Walls are built for defense, to defend, to separate also. And so there is no defense. And you might say, well, what does that mean to us today? What, what, what do walls mean to us today? I mean, I don't know whether you realize, friend, but the Bible says everything that was written in the Old Testament is for us today. So when it says the walls are broken down, what does it mean for us at City Impact Church here in 2018? It's a good question. Well, it's pretty clear that the walls of the city for us are symbolic. We don't have to build a natural wall around our church here on the North Shore at Mount Wanning. Imagine if we did. Because, you know, gang pads have walls around them, right? Big high fences, cameras, security cameras. Imagine if we built a big wall around our church complexes. Then you would be in trouble, right? So we're not talking about natural walls, but we are talking about symbolic walls. And walls are there for protection. Walls are there for separation. Walls, not only today, but also in the Bible, especially around the city of Jerusalem, had very symbolic meaning apart from the protection and separation. They also talked about the glory of God. They spoke of the salvation of God. They spoke of protection of God for his people. Now the walls had fallen down and the enemy had come in and ravaged the people of God. So what does that mean for us today? Because we are called to rebuild the walls that are in decay and are broken down. So I want you to think about for a moment with me this morning, what walls in our city have been broken down? What walls are in disarray? We're told that the nations decay and the walls of natural defenses go in nine cycles. They'll come up on the screen to give you some idea of what I'm talking about today. Number one, people go from bondage to spiritual faith. When people are in bondage, just like the people did in Egypt, they begin to pray. Because, you know, when you're in hardship, that's when people pray. When you're in comfortability, people don't bother praying. 
But then you go from spiritual faith to courage, from courage to liberty, from liberty to abundance, from abundance to selfishness, from selfishness to complacency, from complacency to apathy, from apathy to dependence, from dependence back again into bondage. Now, if you just hold that there for a moment, this is a proven cycle of nations over the history of time. I want you to think about where New Zealand is right now. On the one to nine, I want you to think about where New Zealand is. I was thinking about it, and I want to tell you where New Zealand is. New Zealand, I believe, is right between number eight and nine. The whole point of socialism is to get you dependent on the system. And we've got a socialist prime minister and government in power now. And the whole point is to get you dependent on the system. And so as a church, I believe we need to focus on number one. I want people to have spiritual faith again. I want freedom and liberty in our nation. That's what people fought for. That's why uh, the apostles died, for freedom and liberty. Amen? And I do believe we can turn the tide. I believe it. I believe we can turn the tide and herald in a new era. Why not? Nehemiah did. I said Nehemiah did. When he got out of his comfortability, when he began to take the burden of the Lord upon him, he turned the tide. And it's time for us to take our place along the walls and rebuild the walls of the spiritual defense that God wants us to have for the sake of the thousands of lives. Let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. Who knows? Who knows that there are thousands of lives better off over there at Mount Wellington because here on the North Shore, we rolled up our sleeves and went there. We got out of our palace. We got out of our city. We got out beyond our walls and went over there, planted a campus, and now there are thousands of people, and I'm talking to them right now, that have had their lives changed because City Impact Church did something about it. And I believe when we go to the West and the East, likewise, thousands of people will be impacted because we got out of our comfortability, got out beyond our walls, hallelujah, and had a burden for the city. Because we believe, we belong, we cut, become, and we build. So we build the walls up again. One of the walls that is crumbling, let me give you an example today, just so you know, what I'm talking about, in society, one of the walls that is broken down in our city, in our nation, is the family wall. The, there's a war against the home today. I think you know it. I mean, let's be honest, with all respect to a woman in the house, but much of the feminist movement today are anti-home, anti-the family. And many get caught up putting things that need to be put right, and obviously there's a lot of wrongs done, and I'm not talking about that, but we need to understand equal value. I know you just had a National Woman's Day while I was away, and you might have celebrated, and I know there's a National Men's Day, Josh pointed out to me between services, but it's not as highlighted as a National Woman's Day. We just need a National People's Day. But in any case... Let me read what one feminist wrote. She wrote, with the destruction of the nuclear family, because that's the goal of the enemy, you know that. Again, again, our enemy is not people, it's the devil that influences people for evil. And when she talks about the nuclear family, she's talking, of course, about a father and a mother and children living under one roof. With the destruction of the nuclear family must come a new way of looking at children. They must be seen as the responsibility of the entire society rather than than individual parents. And so the agenda of the government of the day, and let's be honest, Helen Clark endeavored to do it, is to push people to say, we need to take your children, teach your children, brainwash your children, indoctrinate your children to the new society and the new ways of doing things. Now, of course, they do that through the schools, they do it through childcare centers, and so forth, so forth. And you know that is happening today. I mean, even here in the church, all our young people, as awesome as they are, and we've got awesome young people, but I know when I speak on certain subjects that are in the Bible, they think that I might be out of date, out, old-fashioned, or whatever. But the Bible doesn't change, and it's not easy for young people today because they've been taught in schools and taught in society by watching movies, listening to rock stars and all that. 
of a whole new way of doing things. But the way that it's going is leading to bondage. So family. I mean, I was looking at the statistics on divorce on, on, on Google, and even though, of course, marriage, the marriage rates are down, less people are getting married today because more people are just living together. It was called checking up in my day. Don't know whether it still is called checking up. Is it still called checking up? No? It's not. Thank you. Any case, people are living together now, not choosing to get married, but divorce, of course, is still a lot higher. It high, actually uh, peaked in 1970 because of the liberation of that day. But abortion, kids can have abortion today without parents' consent at school. Of course, the same-sex marriage. It's interesting, you know, Toplin, our tour guide, had never heard of the term transgender. Muslim nation, never heard of the term transgender. Interesting, isn't it? But never heard of the term born again either. But like a frog in hot water, as society crumbles around us, we can say, well, it's not our problem. It's no concern to us. We are comfortable. We live in the king's palace. Hallelujah. We live at a distance from the west or from the east or whatever it is, or from Tonga or from Mexico or other places in India we're involved in. We can say the problem is too big for us. You think about Turkey, 99% Muslim. I mean, that's a huge problem. He had no understanding of what born again was. He believed in God. They believe in God. But Jesus, that's a whole nother deal. Could you imagine the apostle Paul and the early disciples going to Ephesus, going to these places, going there, and nobody had any idea of this new teaching about salvation through Jesus. They had no idea about it. And so, you know, for us, it's no different to what the Apostle Paul had. He had a huge problem. Imagine trying to take a new teaching to a whole nation. Acts chapter 19, verse 1. Let's, let, let's look at it. It happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the upper country and came to Ephesus. Now, I put up a couple of photos of Ephesus just to show you uh, where the city was here. I bought the same wife back as the one I went with. That's good, isn't it? And uh, here we are. Now, this is down uh, the way. This, same, this is where the apostle Paul walked down the street, this same street. Uh, next photo shows a library down the bottom of Ephesus, a great ruins. Obviously, I know some of you have been there before, but that's exactly where the Apostle Paul was, in, in that library. He's in the city. About that time, there occurred no small disturbance concerning the way. That's what they called Christians before they were called Christians at Antioch. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made short silver shrines of Artemis, was bringing... No little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together with the workmen of similar trades and said, Men, you know that our prosperity depends upon the business. Now, notice it's about money again. I mean, outside the temple, and here's a photo of, of the temple of Diana, of Emmaus, I can't pronounce it right, but this is the site. There's only one column left. You'll see the photo of the column in a moment. This is the ruins. Of the there, there's that photo of one column that's left there. Do you know outside that temple today, uh, there's still people selling stuff, postcards and, and uh, flutes and you know books and all that, exactly the same. And they were selling their silver trinkets outside the temple. They were concerned that the apostle Paul was going to restrict their sales, stop their sales. Verse 26, you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but all, most all of Asia, Turkey, this Paul, and further beyond, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a considerable number of people, saying that God's made with hands are no gods at all. Not only is there danger that this trade of ours fall into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis is be regarded worthless, and that she, whom all of Asia and the world worship, will even be dethroned from her magnificence. But when they heard this and were filled with rage, they began to cry out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. The city was filled with confusion. Sounds a lot like society today. They rushed with one accord into the theater, dragging along Gaius and some other guy, whose name I can't pronounce, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia. 
It's just like dragging along Tim and Janine. <laughs> and when Paul wanted to go into the assembly, the disciples would not let him. Also, some of the uh, Aserahs who were friends of his sent to him and repeatedly urged him not to venture into the theater. So then some of them were shouting one thing, some another, for the assembly was in confusion and the majority did not know for what reason they'd come together. I mean, it's, it's like riots, you know, they didn't even really know what they're there for, but people get caught up in these stuff. You see it on television, riots, and it's happened, of course, in America and other countries. And here was Paul, he wanted to go and address the crowd, but the disciples held him back. This was in the theater in Ephesus. I want to show you a clip of that theater right now. Thank you. We were sitting in the amphitheater in the arena in the city of Ephesus. This seats 24,000 people. And amazingly, this is where the Apostle Paul wanted to come and address the crowd. But the crowd was shouting, Great is Diana, great is our ministry, their, their gods and their temple. And he wanted to come and address them. But his disciples kept them out. They said it's too dangerous to come in here. Paul walked up the way that you're looking at now, came into the city from the sea. Uh, of course, you know, we're in modern day Turkey, but this is Asia Minor in the Bible. It's got a huge significance in the life and the history of Christianity and the, and the history. And it's just awesome to be here, isn't it, mate? I mean, just the history that's here. We just came down from the library, uh, just came down from uh, another way up there where the Apostle Paul walked in and, and this amazing city of Ephesus. Uh, there are ruins today, but what went on here and what happened in the life of Christianity is, is incredible. And it's just so awesome to be here. So we could say, well, you know, long time ago, what's it to do with us? Well, it's got everything to do with us. Yep. This is what the church was built on, is people giving their lives and standing up in, in the midst of opposition. And you've got opposition today. I, I, I showed you. There are people who, who oppose you, people who don't like you. But as I said, you don't, you don't get all upset, split your toys, you pray. Just like Nehemiah did. Amen. And so I know we got it good today. And I praise God for that. I think about whether it's dentists or, or medical, uh, cars, you know, clothes. We got it so good today. Although there's no bed like home, right? Uh, but the thing is, is that we have it good today here in New Zealand. But society's walls have, have broken down. The gates of Burma fire. And make no mistake, you might think, well, you know, is, does it really affect you? It will affect your kids. And it will affect your grandkids. They're going to have to grow up in, the, in a world that if you and I don't move something and shift something, they're going to grow up in a world that they may never hear about being born again. Hello? Imagine growing up in a, in a country, never hear being born again. I don't know about you, but I had an opportunity to come to Christ because of the freedom that we had here in our nation. But a lot of people don't have it, and that could come here in New Zealand. Make no mistake about it. That's the agenda of the enemy, to silence the church. And of course, affecting our kids, and that's why, of course, we have a school, City Impact Church School. It doesn't receive any government help, and you know, this government, this government certainly won't help us, but you know, the thing is, is that you might say, well, what's that got to do with me? I've got no kids. I got my kids go to another school, and you know, you don't care. But City Impact Church, we are doing our best to raise up Nehemiahs. We're doing our best to raise up Ezra. We're doing our best to raise up people like Apostle Paul, people who've got a biblical worldview, young people that understand the importance of the gospel, understand the importance of their mission, that we can make a difference. We can rebuild the walls, the walls that have been broken down, and who can help bring change to better the city and better the nation and the world we live in for the sake of our kids and our grandkids. And, you know, as I mentioned, there, young people, as awesome as they are today, I understand the pressure that they're under from society and from the institutions that they go to, university, that they get taught all kinds of things that are anti the Bible. You know, the scriptures are not being read and believed like they should be. And throughout the whole world, the family is the foundation of any nation. You've heard the saying, as go the family, so go the nation. And then family is under attack. Family is one of the walls that have been broken down. I'm sure you understand that. Moral values have been broken down. We see the walls of family disintegrating before our eyes. But let's turn the problem into an opportunity. The walls of decency are decaying. 
And I think it's time for us to wake up and to understand what is happening. I mean, let me just give you another example. I think it's like pornography. It stares us in the face as we drive down the motorway. When we watch the news, the ads on television, or whether it's the magazines and, and whatever it is, it's just like a sewer pipe that's spewing all over society through every media outlet. And what's happened is we, get se- we have ceased to be shocked. But once we were shocked, now we just sit there, and what used to amaze us now amuses us. And what was horrible yesterday is acceptable today, and be- what's worse, it becomes a stepping stone for tomorrow. Do you know they call it the progressive society? You would have heard that term, the progressive society. And anybody who resists the progressive society is called a bigot, a hater, uh, an intolerant person. That's why people are anti what you and I stand for. But we're not bigots. We're not intolerant. We're not haters. We love people. We'll do our best to help people. We'll reach out with the greatest cause on planet Earth to see people saved from heaven to hell. You know, when I think about pornography and that sort of thing, the Bible says, can a man take hot coals in his feet and not be burned? Can a man take a fire in his bosom and not be burned? In other words, can a person feed on garbage and not affect his health? Listen, as I close today, when I think about the wall of decency in our education system, what's happened in our education system is the same as in America. And you might say, well, what's, uh, what have I got to do with America? Well, you've heard the saying, as America goes, so the world goes. You've heard that saying. What happened? Well, of course, they took prayer out of schools. We took prayer out of schools. They took the Bible out of schools. We took the Bible out of schools. And so the Bible, Bible in schools in New Zealand is under huge attack today. The Sambalots have risen up and trying to outlaw Bible in schools today. The last bastion, as it were, in public schools of teaching children about the Bible And so when the Bible's out, when God's out, evolution is in, illicit sex is in, abortion is in, it just goes on and on. Are you out there today? And so rebellion comes in, honor is out, and soon, if you and I get too complacent, euthanasia will come in, marijuana will come in, legal legal marijuana. What will that do? Cause more mental health issues because that's what drugs do. Somebody is telling me just between the break, because a, a tragic thing happened, young people taking ecstasy down in Christchurch, Dave Story is telling me that now the government want to, uh, or somebody wants to introduce a tool so that young people can test the drugs they're taking so they'll be safe because they took this ecstasy that wasn't ecstasy and you know, nearly killed them, right? But that's just like needles. If ever's at the airport and you go into the bathroom, there's needles there for your, for your drugs to put in the, you know, give you a clean needle. And so we're just like the frog in hot water. Is it helping society? No, it's not. And of course, a teacher or parent might today say, well, you should do what is right. But society say, well, what is right? What is wrong? If it feels good to you, do it. It's like they say there's no absolutes. But the answer to that is, are you absolutely sure? So my friend, unless there's a God in heaven, unless there's a Bible to be followed, Mankind will return to the dark ages. Bondage will come back to society. And we need to come back to moral foundations. And I close with this thought. The Bible says in Psalm 11, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Can I tell you what the righteous can do? Can I tell you what the righteous can do? If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? What can City Impact Church do? Because I look around me, there's no two ways about it. Foundations are being destroyed. Can I tell you what we can do? We can do what Nehemiah did. We can pray. We can pray. We can fast. That's what Nehemiah did. He fasted and he prayed. Can I tell you what else he did? You might go silent on me. And I haven't even read it, but in Nehemiah chapter 5, he led the way financially and gave to restore the nation. He prayed, he fasted, and he gave. Next week, we'll have an opportunity to give. To give in our miracle offering towards the West, we're going to establish that. I'll be showing you the facility we're going to. We obviously need finance to do it, and uh, so forth, so forth. But the thing is, is Nehemiah gave. 
And chapter 5, and that whole chapter is about him giving in chapter 5 because he heard that the, 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 the church, the Levites, were in disarray financially, and it ends up, remember me, O God, for good according to all that I've done for this people. I preached on that before I left. And I hope and pray that next week you'll come in faith, you'll come in prayer, and you'll be able to say, God, remember this offering that I'm bringing this morning, the sacrificial offering, this miracle offering. Remember me, O Lord, in that. Church, we've got an opportunity. You might say, well, it looks like a difficulty to me, but it's an opportunity to see the church come into all that God's got for her. You know, around the world, as I talk with pastors, as I said, there are amazing things happening. Muslims by the dozens are having dreams and visions of Jesus Christ. He's appearing to them personally. Here was Tomlin. How old was he? 46, I think, 50 years of age. Never had heard the term born again. Never met a born again person. How is he going to hear? Jesus Christ is appearing to them personally in dreams and visions. I had pastors, many of them testifying. Tim and Janine will tell you, testifying of thousands of Muslims coming to Christ around the world today. God loves Muslims just as much as he loves Western people. Let's be no mistake, people. And so God is pouring out his spirit upon all flesh. And I believe here in New Zealand, let's not our apathy, let's not our complacency lead us into bondage. But let this, I believe, this problem become (laughs) an opportunity for us to pray, to fast, and to give for the glory of God. Are you with me today?